Hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the FCR Global Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Anjana Devi Shrikant. I'm a PhD researcher at uh, Denton Green Cities, and um, today supporting me for these uh, the hosting of this is Helen Fan, who's um, a researcher in uh, agropolitan territories. Um, so today we have uh, Heidi Silvanoinen, who's going to be talking about the effect of urban design on walkability. Um, so Heidi is a part of the city's knowledge graph. For those of you who've attended Peter's talk last time, and we're really excited to have you. Yeah, so thank you very much for having me, Helen and Anjana, and also thanks to everyone in the audience for attending. Uh, so as Helen said, that I'm currently, or as, sorry, Anjana said, I'm currently part of the CD's Knowledge Graph team. And this research um, that I'm presenting now was published this year, but it's something I've done earlier. Um, but I'll just be talking about um, this study and how urban design can affect walkability. And basically, I'll focus on the experimental methods in the virtual reality research, and also discuss some of the practical implications for urban design. And, um, and urban planning. And I'll also at the end touch upon some lessons that I learned during this process because it was a multidisciplinary research effort. Um, so that might be relevant for anyone else considering these similar topics or just multidisciplinary research in general. Um, okay, well, starting with uh, why should you care about walkability? So basically uh, walkable environments are ones where a lot of walking takes place. That's the most simple definition. Um, and walkable environments have environmental benefits because they can um, walking can replace car travel, which leads to better air quality and less CO2 emissions, etc. Um, oh, somebody entered the room. Um, yeah, uh, walkable environments can also have social benefits, like maybe there is a greater chance of social interaction with your community if you leave your home, um, and then. There have been studies that looked at elderly people and they feel like they have more control over their own life when they're able to leave their home on their own and go to places. And there are a lot of public health benefits like reduced rates of cardiovascular and respiratory diseases and better mental health. And of course, all of these different benefits also have economic implications. So uh, you will have to do less, um, spend less money reducing environmental harms if there are less of them to begin with. And if you prevent illnesses, then that will also mean cost savings. So there are a lot of reasons why people are interested in walkability. But then the problem is that even though walking is a simple activity, then actually finding out what are the environmental factors that affect the amount of walking takes place is a lot more difficult because it's a multivariate, multi-scale problem um, or phenomenon. And there are a lot of different things that can influence walkability. So one of the things is that a walkable environment needs to be convenient. Uh, you need to have good access to the destinations where you want to walk. Um, this can be analyzed by things like space syntax. Uh, you need to have a route that's free of obstacles, that has a good pavement type. Uh, you can't have too much of a slope. Uh, there are safety considerations, like safety from vehicles and crime. Uh, you need to have good enough street lighting. Um, you need to have a comfortable environment. That could mean that uh, it's not too hot there. So that could be influenced by something like the urban heat island effect. Uh, it needs to be clean and it needs to be attractive. So things like parks and just nice buildings are attractive to people and they influence their um, willingness to walk there. So there are a lot of these different features that are like range from city scale or neighborhood scale to a very local small scale. And it's difficult to sum all of them up into an index that would tell you how walkable a place is. Um, but there have been a lot of walkability indices that have been developed. So one very simple one that's quite popular is, um, is this uh, walk score, which is an American company actually that developed this. So this basically gives a walk walkability score or walk score to any address in the world. And it's more accurate for American addresses, but it did give an address, it did give a walkability score for my house. So I live here where this blue dot is, which is very close to where we are today uh, near the black dot. 
and it says that my um, house is or my address is very walkable because there are all these different amenities that are nearby, like restaurants, coffee shops, bars, groceries, etc. Uh, but the thing is, it doesn't take into account things like on my way to the office, I need to cross this busy road. And sometimes it takes like up to three or I don't know how many minutes to just wait for the traffic lights to turn. So I wouldn't necessarily want to come here that often just because I like to avoid that road. And then also like if I go to all these shops that are on the other side of the road, then I need to cross that pedestrian bridge. So I usually go up the stairs, which is a bit of an effort. And then like walking along this narrow path next to the highway also isn't like the most relaxing place to walk. Uh, and if it's very hot, there's no shade. So all of these types of considerations would affect how much I want to walk in my environment. So luckily I do like to walk in my environment. It's just that this is an illustration of uh, the different things that might influence a person. Um, and then therefore, in order to take all these different considerations into account, you would need a lot more analyses and experiments of all the different factors that influence walkability. So regarding the convenience, uh, you might do some kind of space syntax analysis. Um, regarding safety, uh, there have been some analyses of different road types and like crossing types that influence how much people want to walk somewhere. Uh, there have been also analyses of like microclimate and how that affects people's willingness to walk. And then there have also been some analyses of the urban design features and attractiveness of streets that affect people's willingness to walk somewhere. And the thing that we focused on in the virtual reality experiment was this last one. So particularly the attractiveness of the built environment and how you could measure how the built environment um, attractiveness specifically affects how much people want to walk. Um, so why is this topic important? Uh, so there have been some studies that looked at all the different factors that might influence walkability and asked people to basically rate uh, how rate the quality of that feature in their own neighborhood and then secondly rate how much they walk. So for example, when one of the features was experience, so that included aesthetic slope, wayfinding, thermal comfort. So the questions included things like there are attractive buildings and homes where I am and then they uh, gathered all these responses um, and then they uh, correlated those responses with the actual amount of walking that takes place and they found that this experience category which included things like the aesthetics that was one of the most important um, it had high, one of the highest correlations with actual walking activity so i think it is important but it's just very difficult to measure so that's why the attractiveness of the built environment hasn't been considered a lot in these walkability indices. So here's an example of one um, walkability index called the Q+, which is developed by some academic researchers, and it's supposed to be holistic. So it's supposed to be better than the walk score that I showed earlier. But this one measures attractiveness as uh, the number of shops per square kilometer. So like it's just so hard to measure people's more, more like rounded experience that usually the walking indices or walkability indices do some very simple metric. Um, yeah, so then, um, so even though the well, attractiveness of the built environment is often not considered, there have been some past studies that have looked at its importance and how it contributes to walkability. Uh, so these studies are all by uh, Rai Dewing. Uh, and his team, because I think they're like very high quality. So I'll just discuss these. But basically they started by creating an operational definition of walkable urban design features by asking an expert panel to rate the walkability of different streets. And then they looked at what were the common features of the streets that got high walkability scores. Uh, then they quantified each street in terms of the different urban design features that they had. So um, if there was a lot of facade transparency, they would rate each street in terms of its facade transparency and all the other features that were identified by the expert panel as contributing to walkability. Um, then they counted the pedestrian, number of pedestrians on each of these street segments. And finally, they correlated the 
presence of the urban design features with that number of pedestrians. And they did this in two different cities. So firstly in New York City and secondly in Salt Lake City in the US. Um, and this analysis basically showed that of the five different urban design variables that they had come up with, um, only transparency, which is the second last one, was significantly associated with the pedestrian counts. And the problem with transparency is that like it's very closely or it can be quite closely associated with the presence of shops, because usually if you have that transparent facade, then there's also some kind of shop there. So it's kind of hard to tell the difference between those two things. And they did try to uh, control for the presence of shops by also including the walk score in this model. So they found that even when you consider walk score, transparency is important. But then the problem was that in the other study, the walk score was not up to date because there was like recently a new big mall in that area and that hadn't been updated in the walk score. So then you don't know how well that controlled for it. And then even in the other study, uh, like even if you buy these results, uh, you can still ask, is it very location specific to Salt Lake City and New York and the particular types of buildings that are there and so on. So it would still be good to have other studies from different locations. Um, so then we did this virtual reality experiment on the urban design features that contribute to walkability. Um, and this was originally my master's thesis, but then it was uh, published in a paper this year. Uh, so I originally did the research in 2019, but it was only published now. And um, it was done together with a team. So my supervisor was Professor B. Getunser from the FCL2 group, uh, Big Data Informed Urban Design and Government. And then Peter, who is in the audience today, um, was my advisor and helped with the study design and writing and a lot of different things. And um, Dr. Saskia Kuliga, uh, who was at that time working as a researcher for the Cognition, Perception and Behavior in Urban Environment Scheme. Uh, she was an expert in virtual reality and she really helped a lot with the experiment design. And then Saskia's colleague uh, at her next job, uh, Daniela from Germany. She's an expert in statistics and then she helped with the statistical analysis. So this was a multidisciplinary team. There was a collaboration between two different FCL teams. Um, yeah, so then in the virtual reality experiment, we decided to choose the features included uh, based on Jan Gell, who is a, who is a Danish architect and practitioner, urban design practitioner. So he's pretty influential and he has his own consultancy called Gale Architects. He's also conducted original research and published books and he's been featured a lot in the popular media. And there are, there are quite many cities that have implemented his guidelines to improve walkability. So here are just a few examples. One is New York. Uh, they published this uh, street design guideline that is meant to make New York more walkable. So they implemented or in that guideline, they recommended that streets are designed according to Gale's idea. So there would be narrow bits of uh, buildings to make the um, street more varied and like more interesting to pedestrians. Uh, then, and there were also other ideas, but that's just one. Then in Helsinki, they did an evaluation of existing streets based on Gale, just to identify where you might want to focus urban planning resources. And in Calgary, for example, they quoted Gale and um, recommended these transparent facades and other things, uh, and this like setback building. So the building is low at the front and tall at the back uh, in their plan for the Chinook station area. So these are just some examples, but there are also other examples from uh, Copenhagen and Australia and um, several other places. So therefore, yeah, so this is the reason why we used Gale when we um, decided which urban design features to uh, investigate in our study. And the first um, feature that we looked at was liveliness. So on the left, you can see that there are two environments in the virtual reality experiment. One has basically no people and the other one has several people. So this one is more lively. And um, it has people walking around and chatting, so they're not just like rushing off somewhere. And according to Gale, liveliness is really the cornerstone of um, 
highly walkable and high quality urban design because it creates this friendly atmosphere where there are lots of people talking to each other and maybe you could also talk to new people um, and therefore you're attracted to that place and when you're there it will be even more lively and somebody else will be attracted there so it's this kind of virtual cycle according to him um, the second feature was high facade quality so uh, one of the features of high facade quality is this transparency uh, so you can see from outside to the inside of the building and vice versa so that again creates that sense of liveliness and also another feature of high facade quality is having detailed facades that have a lot of variation and that are narrow that have narrow and visually distinct units so for example in this high quality version at the bottom um, it's all part of the same building but there are visually distinct units that are more narrow so there's the pink unit and the white unit and there's transparency so and also variation in colors and the shapes of the windows and so on. So this would be a higher quality facade compared to the top one. And then the third feature that we looked at was having low buildings. So Gail just says that tall buildings discourage walking activity, partly because of they might reduce thermal comfort uh, because they might create like a wind tunnel type of condition. Or then he also implies that they might just be visually unattractive. Um, and he says that either you should have low buildings, like in the bottom image, or then these L-shaped buildings that are kind of low at the bottom and tall at the back. And that was also the strategy they um, recommended in that Calgary uh, urban design plan. Um, so these were the different features we looked at, and we looked at their effect on walking activity. And then uh, in the virtual reality, and that was the reason why we chose Young Gale. But then why did we choose the virtual reality method for this design or this study? Uh, so first of all, the benefit of a virtual reality experiment is that you can have a controlled experiment. So you can isolate the effect of the independent variables like building height or uh, liveliness, which is really difficult to do in real life. And that has been one of the kind of difficulties of conducting this type of research in real life, because in real environments, uh, there are just so many things changing all the time that it's hard to know what causes what. Um, and the second thing about virtual reality, one question that always comes up is the validity. But based on some reading, uh, it seemed like virtual reality experiments are quite valid because there have been studies that compared people's like questionnaire responses when they're in this real um, grocery store looking thing where, where compared to when they're in a virtual reality version of the same place. Um, so they answer their this questionnaire that asks something like, do I feel present here uh, in a similar way? And then there have also been studies that looked at people's physiological responses to virtual reality and compare, to, compare that to real environments. So uh, when people are put in a high place in that virtual environment, so this is like very high above the building's roofs, then they exhibit similar signs of stress uh, as in real life. Although I don't think they did this particular example in real life because it would be <laughs> dangerous. But yeah, and then when people were put in the same kind of ledge, but on street level, they didn't exhibit that kind of physiological sign of stress. So it seems like virtual reality is pretty valid. And then uh, the third benefit for us was that you can measure people's movement speed when they're in virtual reality. So. Uh, one of Gail's ideas was that if there's a high quality environment, then people walk more slowly and um, because they're enjoying themselves there. So that's easy to measure in VR. Um, then our study context was Singapore. So as I mentioned, a lot of the previous research has focused on North America and Europe. So Singapore might be interesting because Singapore is kind of different in terms of population density and building height. And it's known that um, preferences environmental preferences are affected by familiarity. So maybe people in a place like Singapore don't have the same preferences for walkability as people in North America. Um, and then the study focused on HDB estates specifically because um, that allows studying the effect of the facade quality without the confounding factor of the presence of shops because an HDB estate is a residential area. So you can just focus on the facade features and not not be confused by the presence of shops. And we tested three specific hypotheses. 
So the first was that all these three features together, facade quality, building height, and liveliness, would affect walking activity. And secondly, that each of these features individually would, leave, uh, would have a positive effect on walking activity. And the third one was that liveliness would have the biggest effect because that's what young Gale was always saying. Um, and then in order to test these hypotheses, we had to design the environments that differed with respect to the three features. So the first step was to choose some real life environments that, had, that we could use as a basis for the uh, virtual environments. So we chose two uh, real life HDV environments after reviewing quite many different HDV estates in Singapore. And the ones we chose were the two at the top. So one called Bedok and one called Sime, uh, or one in Bedok and one in Sime. Those are two neighborhoods in Singapore. Um, so we chose these environments because they both displayed like high levels of facade quality according to Gale's guidelines, but had slightly different versions of facade quality. So this one has like more variation in color, whereas this one has more shapes, more variation in shapes and details. So that we could like test Gale's ideas in that slightly more broad way, rather than just testing, for example, whether one colorful environment is better than that non-colorful environment. It's good to have a few different environments where you test. Um, then after we had chosen the environments, we created like virtual versions of them. So varying the um, number of floors and the number of people, and then creating this bad facade version of them. So creating a bad facade is pretty easy. You just do something very simple that is not transparent and doesn't have any variation. So that was quite easy to do. And then we conducted a pilot study to test whether the, whether the environments were designed well. So one of the issues in the pilot study was testing whether people perceive, give the same rating in our walkability questionnaire to the picture of the real environment as to the uh, virtual environment, just to check that they're valid or realistic. And there were some other questions too, like how many different environments can people experience before they start to feel really bored and other like tests like that. And then we created all the different environments that were manipulated with respect to the three features. And some of the combinations had to be left out because there would have been 24 different combinations and that would have meant recruiting so many people uh, because it would be, we decided that about nine environments per person is a good amount. So you couldn't give 24 environments to one person because then they would start to answer the questions in a really like quick way just to get done with that whole experiment. So we decided that nine is better. Um, or is that roughly a good amount? Uh, so therefore we couldn't include all the different combinations in the study. Um, then we recruited participants, but before that you had to do this ethics course because we were dealing with human subjects. Uh, then we recruited 48 participants. Um, there were originally 52, but then some of them um, like experienced some technical issues or just didn't do the experiment properly. So we had 48 at the end. They were between 19 and 32, and they were mostly NUS students because we use this recruitment site at NUS. Um, then, as I mentioned, each participant experienced nine environments out of the 14 total that were included. Um, and then we did a power calculation. So we found that 45 participants were required to detect me medium to large effect sizes for a particular type of statistical test. Um, then, of course, the measured variable was walking activity, but that was measured in two different ways. So one was like the speed of the participants as they moved through the environments, and the other was this activity questionnaire. So the activity questionnaire asked things like, I would stop in this place. Uh, I would pass through here on my way to another destination. I would enjoy walking in this space. So it was meant to measure like optional walking activities. And then the additional Thing that we measured was this post-experiment questionnaire. So that asked things like, did you experience motion sickness? Did you perceive the environments as realistic? And like, what was your age and so on, just to help to interpret the results. And then the experimental procedure was as follows. So first, the participants were asked to sit on this rotating chair with a head-mounted display and a remote control in their hand. And through the display, they could see the environments. 
and they could move. Uh, we, they were asked to follow this yellow line in each of the environments so that all the participants would experience them in the same way. And the movement direction was determined by where the headset was facing. And then you could use the remote control by, you could move by pressing the trigger in the remote control. And there were three different movement speeds. So just staying still, uh, then kind of a slow walking speed and that running speed, just to create some difference between the speeds. And then um, each participant was shown nine different environments in that random order. And after each environment, the participants had to fill in this activity questionnaire that I showed earlier. And then after all the scenes, the participants had to fill in the post experiment questionnaire. And um, in the data analysis, the first step was to do a dimensionality reduction because the questionnaire had asked like six different things for each environment. So it's better to combine those um, six questions into a single score. Uh, so that you just have one score per uh, participant per environment. And then we did the, um, the main analysis was this two by two analysis of variance, uh, a repeated measures version of that. So basically that means that you test if the walking activity is affected by the location. So that means bedok or cine. Uh, if it's affected by the total environmental quality, so that includes both the um, liveliness and the building height and the facade quality, all of those combined. So the lowest quality version of the environment is like it has few people, tall buildings and low quality facades, whereas the higher quality environment has low buildings, many people and high quality facades. So we have the same low versus high quality for, um, for both um, environments. And then there are these two locations, so Bedok and Sime. Um, and then you check if there's an interaction between those, so the location and the environment quality. And all the participants experienced these four environments, so therefore the sample size for these ones was all the participants, except for the speed, because there were some um, like technical problems that reduced the sample size. And then to find out whether uh, the individual features, so building height, facade quality, liveliness, had an effect on walkability, we compared to like different sets of pairs of environments that differed with respect to only one feature at once. So here you can see that these buildings are the, I mean, these environments are the exact same in terms of building height and the number of people, but the facade quality is different. So then you can compare those ratings to see if the facade quality had an impact. But the sample size for these analyses was smaller because not all the participants experienced all the pairs of environments. Um, so then the results for the main analysis uh, were that the questionnaire data, well, first let's look at the questionnaire data on the bottom left. So the hypothesized high quality environments received significantly higher questionnaire scores. Um, so basically the, in both locations, CIMEI and BEDOC, the high quality environment, which is red, got a better questionnaire score of people saying, I want to walk here than the low quality environment. And the effect was about the same for both locations. So there wasn't, that location didn't seem to have an impact and there was no like interaction between the location and the quality. So it wasn't that the quality had a bigger effect in one of the locations. And then the speed data um, had like similar results. So people walked more slowly in those environments that were higher quality in both locations. And then to find out whether each feature, uh, so liveliness, facade quality and building height by itself influenced walkability, we compared the pairs of environments and we found that like in all, in both of the locations, the pairs that differed with respect to facade quality had the biggest difference in rating. So always the higher, the one with the better facade quality got higher ratings in both locations, but not all of the results were statistically significant, partly because of the smaller sample size. And it seemed like the results were more significant and clearer in the case of the bedrock environment. So in the case of this one with the pink building, um, and how you could interpret these results. So 
Together, all the features had an effect on walkability. So that supports the findings of Gale. Uh, and out of the individual features, facade quality had the greatest effect. So there was some analysis, uh, sorry, some uncertainty in this analysis. And it could be that um, some of this uncertainty was caused by the fact that some of the facade improvement strategies were more effective than others. Like maybe the variation in color is just a more effective uh, way to improve facade quality than the variation of shapes. Um, and then maybe liveliness was not important in our experiment because Singaporeans are used to crowded places and they want to be in a calmer place, especially in a residential context. Uh, so there could be all kinds of reasons, but you would need to maybe do more studies to confirm those interpretations. And then um, based on the post-experiment questionnaire results, it seemed like participants noticed the manipulations were not affected by motion sickness and like perceived the environment as fairly realistic. So it seems like the study was pretty valid. Um, and then finally, some perspectives on the contributions of this work and the applications and future work. So um, one contribution is that we added to the evidence base for urban design and tested the efficacy of these urban design interventions that have been tried in different places in the world. Um, and we noticed that non-commercial urban design features can improve walkability, so they could be taken into account in the different walkability indices. And just there hasn't been a lot of virtual reality research in the walkability field, so I guess this study contributes to um, the methodology of walkability research. And in terms of applications, uh, you could use these kinds of results to improve the walkability indices like walk score or Q plus. And one way you could do this is by using Google Street View data. So you could just use AI methods to classify the street environment and then yeah, calculate pedestrians as well. And then see, yeah, just use that to make a better walkability index. Um, and then, of course, the facade features and the building height and the liveliness are pretty easily quantifiable things. So that's why it might be possible to use this image based data. And future work uh, might want to look at these results in different contexts, like we do a similar experiment and maybe focus on more specific facade features. And then, of course, uh, think of ways to automatically measure this stuff on streets so that you could uh, analyze actual cities with this method and then do real life studies to confirm the results like in a non-virtual reality context. Um, and then finally moving on to the lessons learned. So as I mentioned, this was a quite a multidisciplinary project. So that means that um, there was we definitely noticed there was a tension between the experimental point of view and the planning point of view, because I come from an architecture background. So architects and planners would be interested in knowing the holistic walkability of a street. But if you're doing an um, experiment, then it's much better to have a few, like only very few variables that you're varying in order to get like a bigger sample size and more, um, more certain results. So that was one of the things that was kind of a problem. I think we, it might have been better to leave out a few of the variables, like instead of having three different building heights, only have two, so that then we would have had the sample, the biggest sample size for all the different environments that would have made the analysis a lot easier. But then we thought that the, uh, the three different levels of the building height would be like useful knowledge for uh, practitioners because that is something that has been tried in real life. So there's this tension between what to include versus what you can actually find out using an experiment. Um, then another thing I learned is that designing an experiment is not such a simple task because you need this ethics approval, you need to do a power calculation, pilot study, questionnaire design, uh, control of the experimental conditions. So like Saskia, the psychologist, really taught me a lot about this. And she made sure that it was done properly, uh, except the power calculation we didn't do in the beginning, which also caused some problems later. Uh, then the third thing that I learned is that publishing this kind of interdisciplinary work can be a bit difficult because we this was accepted in the third journal, third journal that we submitted to. 
And I think like maybe sometimes they couldn't find good reviewers. Sometimes the reviewers didn't know much about statistics. Uh, sometimes the reviewers were like, why is this topic important? <laughs> so in this last journal, one of the reviewers only comment was why is this topic important and who is young girl? <laughs> so then <laughs> that's like kind of hard to <laughs> explain maybe, uh, or you have to explain it at a very basic level. So yeah, these are things to consider if you do another research project like this. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Hayu. It yeah. was a great talk. Um, so maybe we move on to questions now. Yeah, sure. Um, so for the live audience, we have a mic right here. If you could hold it like this, we can capture the audio. And um, for our online audience, if you could just uh, message in or you can unmute yourselves if you would like. Yeah. Um, Yeah, go ahead, Beatrice. I just have a, a quick question. So this workability score or Q plus, uh, what are they based on? So I understand they are kind of predefined uh, score. I wonder how they are built and what are the criteria that they are built on? Um, yeah, maybe I don't go through all the animations. Um, sorry, let, thanks for the question. Let me just go to that slide. Um, oh. Yeah, so yeah, thanks, Bea. Um, so here are the yeah, the different factors included in the Q plus. Uh, I think they just, like, there has been a lot of walkability research since about the mid 90s. So I think they've just looked at all the different literature that has, um, sometimes it's been mm, survey based, like people ask, the researchers ask people what kinds of things affect whether you like to walk here. Sometimes there have been experiments or these pedestrian counts. So there's all kinds of literature and I think this particular index is just based on a literature review that showed the different um, features that contribute to walkability. But as I said, they do tend to choose things that are easy to measure when they make an index or easy to quantify. But yeah, I, I don't remember the very specific details of this particular um, index. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's clear. So, um, so basically the studies that you did or the study that Gail did are, they also assess workability but using different criteria, right? So they might, the results might correlate or not with this uh, already made workability scores. Yeah, or maybe more specifically, my research would contribute to quantifying the attractiveness. So like finding features of, um, the environment that actually contribute to attractiveness because this particular index calculated attractiveness based on the number of shops per square kilometer. So based on my study, maybe you could also measure things like the dimensions of the facade or the number of people or the height of buildings and therefore create a more accurate measure of the attractiveness. Does anyone in the audience have questions? I have a lot of questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. One. Um, so uh, I uh, wanted to, like you had mentioned that liveliness, um, because Singaporeans may not like liveliness all the time. And so it's a really cultural yeah. based factor, right? And um, also the age group of the particular participants that you've got. So do you think that would like change on a cultural, like age basis and maybe even temporally, like? Liveliness at night is not something yeah. that's wanted. Yeah. So yeah, I think is that's that a, a good way of point. Maybe expanding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why I guess you would have to do a lot of different studies. Uh, so this whole topic becomes like, as I said, it really would require many different experiments and studies because you do, you can do walking in different uh, times of the day and different age groups, and there are all these different environmental conditions that might affect your walking. 
So it's not that very easy thing to study. Um, but regarding the point about age, we did find this one paper by um, a kind of methods focused researcher called Stamps. Um, I forget his first name, but he's done a lot of method um, like research on the validity of virtual reality experiments or the validity of different kinds of architecture studies. And he had done one study on comparing the environmental preferences of students and different like demographic groups. And he found that there are not significant differences. Yeah. <laughs> so there has been some research on that, but I don't remember the very small details. Yeah. It's not, um, maybe not really true, uh, because a few weeks back, uh, if you are aware, it's actually the sound is very weird. Yeah, because like back, I think this is the uh, Mooncake Festival period, correct? The yeah. Autumn Festival period. So there is actually a, a Wayang show that is taking place at Woodlands and it is super crowded. People are like filling up the place even right down to the roadside. Right? Wayang is a classical thing where the Chinese perform a kind of Chinese opera on the yeah. streets. It's actually from the 70s and the art was nearly dying, but now they're trying to revive it. And recently they organized it in Woodlands the whole street came to life. Oh. Yeah, and walkability, it's something about more to like whether there are activities to attract because they have another cultural thing called Pasa Malam. And when they have Pasa Malam, walkability just quadruples. Okay, yeah. So yeah. it's not that Singaporeans are not really into liveliness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's just some, you know, some just kind of contextual regulation. feedback. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Hey, thanks. Um, just, just wondering um, whether or not there has been studies that you're aware of and you know, your own uh, studies as well in terms of measuring health, happiness of the participants as they look at that as opposed to walkability. Mm -hmm. So like whether or not they want to walk through it is one thing, but whether or not they're happy to walk through it um, because that would impact urban design and redesigning in that sense. So you can take something that's existing, yeah. right? And then um, um, uh, make people feel happiness. I mean, there's the whole push for mental health now, yeah. right? So if you can, um, you know, do, do things so that it improves people's health, um, can that be done through virtual re reality? Mm. Well, um, actually I've been like, for this summer project that school, I had to analyze this data that some other people had collected. Um, it was called the ESUM project, that European project, uh, where they collected, they showed these virtual reality, uh, like walking routes to people. And then they measured uh, their like level of sweat and some other physiological indicators. So sweating can mean that you're excited. Uh, and then they tried to correlate the features in the, environments, the virtual environments with these physiological indicators, but there were basically not many results because the data was so messy. So it was hard to do like that. There were some correlations between the subjective ratings of the people. Um, like when they said, oh, I like this place or I don't like this place, but it was pretty hard to find anything. <laughs> yeah. So I think it, this is just a pretty difficult field of research because there are so many different things that might influence how happy people feel. Like, for example, some thought that comes into their head or, you know, anything. Yeah. I am Peter. I'm one of the authors of the paper as well. I'll add a little bit of information on this happiness in particular in reference to Singapore. I think firstly, in the questionnaire, there's some questions that already relate a bit to happiness. Um, and one thing to look into as well is um, results and analyses from the national science experiment that was done in Singapore a couple of years ago. And there people were, and particularly students were wearing sensors and it also had a button which was used as a happy button. And so it was clicked clicked when when there was happiness and so where that happens if you if you analyze that and then correlate it with let's say residential built environment qualities if it is in a residential environment you could make the link between those two 
in the case of Singapore, for example. So that that is an example. Uh, I I can't quote it, so you'll have to look into uh, into the research. Hello, thank you for your report. Um, oh yeah, there. Thank okay. you. Thanks. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, about VR method, right? It, for us, it's like some kind of validation, right? So it's testing and everything. Uh, but maybe you have some thoughts about what about the quality of model in VR? Is it matters is giving someone something for us or not? Because in big question, right? It's like sometimes for validation we can make a simulation, right? And the quality in simulation doesn't matter, right? It's like could be also, you know, simple models walking around and doing some things what we need, right? So VR is like next level in case of, you know, resolution, model, details, everything. What what do you think about this? Is it important to improve the quality of model in VR? Is it will it give something for us or not? Mm -hmm. Well, I think in at least this particular research, it was quite important to have a realistic model uh, because it was really about the aesthetic, um, kind of the attractiveness of the environment. So I don't think you could get any kind of valid results if it was just that white, like white simple walls. Um, but of course it might depend on the field of study. So I know that there was a previous virtual reality experiment where they looked at the building height and the narrowness of the street. And it was just like basically white blocks of building mass. But then they only found differences in people's preferences if it was like way too narrow or way too tall. Uh, so then I think the more realistic it is, then the more nuanced your um, results will be. Like maybe people will think that this is, uh, like you can detect more nuanced differences so if people realize that's a really like fake environment, they can't really relate to this and they don't have a strong opinion either way. But if it's more realistic, then I guess people can say more accurately what they, how they would actually feel or how they would behave in that kind of environment. Yeah, but yeah, I think it probably depends on the field of study. And I would say I'm not really that method ex methods expert. So that was more Saskia, yeah. We have a couple of questions online. Lars, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for a very inspiring presentation. I think it was uh, really good to hear uh, about this. And, and uh, I'm actually very much involved in, in research that uh, are related to this. Um, actually, 15 years ago, I had a PhD student um, uh, that, that worked with how you set up uh, virtual reality studies uh, in, in, in real life environments and especially trying to uh, measure on, um, is, does it matter whether, uh, what kind of, of uh, weather uh, you model, uh, uh, the colors in the model um, and, and how it is actually perceived by, uh, by the test persons. And uh, I might just uh, say a few words about myself. I'm um, associate professor at Auburn University. I've been working with uh, virtual reality since uh, the 1990s. Um, I have uh, especially been interested in this, how you actually can use 3D or um, you could say modeling environments that are realistic enough to, uh, to make you uh, feel like you are in uh, immersive uh, models and also in in the later years combining that with uh, some sensors that um, you talked about them yourself uh, that measure the EDA uh, the e electrodermal activity which is actually what you said the sweat of your palm uh, and how that actually can be a, a, another variable in your studies um, the, the question um, for you would be, have you thought about how much real life environment actually means in a study like this? Because there are dozens of variables you could think about uh, that would influence the results 
of your study if they were done in, you could say, in, in real life. So that instead of doing it in virtual reality, uh, you you kind of uh, you you brought this uh, the participants uh, to a real life situation and and try to to have the same uh, experiments done in life instead of in in virtual reality. What's your opinion about that? Um, so I think there are two things. First of all, in the and thank you for your question. Of course, uh, so it's interesting to hear that you've been involved in this research for a long time um and yeah so i would maybe think of two things immediately so the first is that in real life it's of course not always possible to vary the things that you're interested in uh researching so it's not possible to have a tall building and a low building that are otherwise the same um and to make the person experience the exact same wind conditions or the same weather so at least in the virtual reality, even though you do need to make choices like what is the weather in the model and what kind of a room you conduct the experiment in, you can at least control those so that they're the same for all participants. Um, and then, so yeah, in that sense, some of this would not be possible to do in real life. Um, although I know that there have been studies that looked at, for example, what is the effect of placing benches in a street versus not having them. So for smaller scale, features like that, it might be possible to conduct that experiment in real life. And then the second thing um, was that in the ESUM study that I mentioned earlier, they actually first tried to um, measure the sweat and the other physiological indicators in real life, but they noticed there was so much like variance just due to things like weather or like stopping at traffic or if a car went by that would affect people's um, results so that was much more difficult to control for these random events um so maybe those would be my main two comments but i'm sure for some of the different features that you might want to look at it and some of the like dependent variables like walking maybe would be easier to look at than your stress response there would be less confounding factors then i'm sure for some study designs you could do it in real life yeah Yes, uh, and I agree uh, with you. And, and I didn't say that we have a breakthrough in the, in, in the EDA uh, studies, but I think it's very important actually to have a combination of different methods. Yeah. So as you had a questionnaire, uh, I think it's very important to have either an interview with the, with the test persons or have some um, yeah, other studies uh, that, that actually can either uh, strengthen the, the arguments or or uh, uh, yeah, uh, strengthen your study in 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 all. I have to say that the, the studies we've done until now are very. Um, they are uh, master theses from. Uh, one was done in Berlin, um, walking in Berlin, and the other one was uh, done in Oslo, um, Denmark, uh, uh, this spring. So so it's very few. Uh, live experiments, but we are lining up for a bigger experiments where we have more test persons uh, that have to uh, carry the. Uh, it's actually um, um, an armband now, a, a, a medical watch that can uh, can measure the EDA and uh, and give you the um, the more you could say uh, objective. Uh, measurement of stress level. But yeah. the one thing you can't say is that whether the stress level is negative or positive. That's that's one of the problems, and that's why we need to uh, combine the studies so that you can say more about what was it actually that that uh, made you stressful in this specific location. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it's good to combine yeah. different approaches. So yeah, I wish you good luck for your studies. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, if there are no more questions, then I think we can um, call it a day. Um, thanks so much, Heidi, again, Thank you. for talking at this event. Um,